welcome to Holy Cross as we gather here tonight on our first of four midweek Advent services. And our theme this year is Come Home for Christmas. And we know that because of Jesus and the fact that he is coming again, one day heaven will be our home. Tonight we will light the candle of hope. This is the first week. And we gather as people of hope tonight. So I welcome you. And may God bless this evening and our time together. Our opening hymn of his remain standing, the advent of our God.
of what Christ has done for us through his incarnation, his death and resurrection, we can dare to look to the Heavenly Father for hope and grace, compassion and forgiveness. Christ has only begotten Son bears the punishment we deserve and transforms our lives with his forgiveness. And therefore receive God's declaration of pure grace. And as a called ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are forgiven. The Heavenly Father fills us with hope, joy, and peace through Christ. Come, the Lord Jesus. And we sing. Written in the past was written to teach us, so that through 
endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than the all men. And may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is our hope. And this is a faith-producing, faith-strengthening, and hope-filled blessing of the Lord. Let us stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messengers ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan. And where John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one who is more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated as we sing, Come Thou Long Expecting Jesus. <laughs> Inside and out. 
And since we've got plenty of time, let's find something for every bunny we've ever met, and let's make every kind of cookie where we can ever think of. And to top it all off, we let the kids out of school for two weeks. <laughs> and during those two weeks, every great movie for the next years comes out during that period of time. And so we go to the movies again and again and again. So it's no wonder you're worn out and tired. So I want to begin Advent service by asking all of us to just take a deep breath and slow down. Because the next few minutes may be the only rest you get for the next few weeks. So slow down long enough to think about what the meaning truly is all about. So I invite you to seize the moment, as it says. Lay aside all of your distractions and focus just for a few minutes. Because God wants our attention. As Christians, we start the season of the church year with the season of Advent. In the Latin, it's Adventicus, which means the coming of, the coming of the Savior. It's a holy season for the Christian church that marks a period of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the nativity of Christ. It's also known as the season of Christmas. The church is decorated properly, and thank you to all that helped, and I think all who are here tonight. And the greenery is up to dress the church, and the hope, the love, the joy, the peace are all before us of the coming of our Lord. And the church of the color is blue, signifying the hope found in the coming of our Lord. And they have the candles next to the baptismal font represent a journey, a journey that each week brings us closer and closer to Bethlehem. And today is our first Wednesday, midweek service, and we lit the first candle, the candle of hope. And with the lighting of the candle, we now have begun our journey, venturing forward towards the little town of Bethlehem. Venturing forward, tonight we focus our message on the great hope that is before us. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I have to ask a question of clarification. The question is, what is hope? It's a term that can easily be thrown around today. I hope we have clear weather tomorrow. I hope we have a white Christmas. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but it's snowing Iowa right now. I hope the Dolphins win, and who knows, there are five wins in a row. But that's not the kind of hope that is represented by that lone candle that is lit over there right now. That hope represented by that candle is a greater, a much grander hope. It represents the hope of the entire season for an entire nation. It rep represents the hope of it for the entire world. It represents something you and I often take for granted. Let's face it. We hear the Christmas story multiple times in one year and multiple times in our lives probably. But we forget what life was like before the Christ child came, before the Savior was born. So imagine yourself in their shoes, or our, maybe we should say in their sandals, for those people who lived before the birth of the Christ child. The rich religious life of that time was much different than our own church. It was much more about following strict rules and coming into the sanctuary for a little more than to make sacrifice and offerings to pay the, the atonement for breaking the strict laws they were supposed to be following. It was an endless cycle that never stopped. Follow the laws, can't follow the laws, pay the price, pay, go back out, break the laws, come back and start all over again. Never being good enough, never ending, being able to live up to the law, always falling short. So can you imagine how tired, how frustrated, how defeated, how desperate one would feel? Even frustrated. But there is hope. And that's what we celebrate tonight. As we look into the Old Testament, we see that the hope looked like to them. We go to the book of Jeremiah. Let's go one more slide, please. There we go. And he offers the people of Judah 
and Jerusalem a message of hope, beginning with the words, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And yet, ironically, Jeremiah seems most of the time not to have any hope. He's known as the weeping prophet. The little word of hope was almost out of sync with what Jeremiah's life was like. Jeremiah was probably serving time in jail when he made that statement because he prophesied against King Hezekiah, Zedekiah, and also the people of Judah and Jerusalem, so he was not thought of very much. They charged him as being unfaithful to the Lord and his covenant. Moreover, to add insult to injury, Jeremiah had said that the present siege of Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army was God's instrument of punishment upon the people of Jerusalem and the people of Judah. And he says, it's pointless to resist them. Just let them do it. And such a prophet, prophetic message went over like a lead balloon. So no wonder Jeremiah was in jail. And yet, Jeremiah remains faithful to God and proclaims the oracle of hope in spite of this immediate situation of hopelessness. The days are surely coming, Jeremiah prophesies, when the Messiah King will come to rule with justice and righteousness. They would not have to make atonement forever and ever, and soon there would come the Lord who would never laugh. And to summarize, the prophet Jeremiah says, the throne will never be empty, and the debt will forever be paid upon the coming of our Lord. In our world today, there is a legion of region, reasons to live without hope. All around us, there's so much suffering and evil and injustice. From the war in the Ukraine, the continued conflict in North Korea, and there's China, to the stress we face every day with inflation, recession, the political unrest, who's elected, who's not elected, to the countless shootings right in our own community, and even one of our own school children was the one on I-95 that got hit the other night. It touches home. The cost of medical care, loved ones suffering, another person diagnosed with cancer, Another one with a flesh-eating infection. We might, might wonder, where is there any hope? Is hope real or only a, an idealistic dream? And yet, there was where there's life, there's hope, and where there's hope, there's life. Jeremiah wrote to his people about the great hope that they had, and this is the hope that the shepherds had in their hearts the night that the angels appeared and gave to them the message of great hope and joy. The Savior has been born. No more. He is coming, but He is here. Can you imagine their excitement? Can you imagine their hope? The anticipation, the eagerness to, to run as fast as they could to Bethlehem to see the Lord? The shepherds were overflowing with hope and joy because of what it meant for them and because of what it means to all of us even today. It's like this. Years ago, there was a wealthy man who with his devoted young son started a passion of collecting art. Together they traveled the world, adding the, only the finest art treasures to their collection. Priceless works of Picasso and Van Gogh and Monet, and many others, they adorned the walls of the family estate. The little father, though, looked on with satisfaction as his only son became an expert in art collecting. But the day came when there was a war that broke out in their country. And the son said, Dad, I must go fight the war. And off he went. And only a few weeks later, the dad received a telegram that said that his beloved son had been killed while carrying a fellow soldier to the medic. On Christmas morning, all alone and depressed, there was a knock at the door. The old man opened the door. And he was greeted by a soldier with a large package under his arm. He introduced him by saying, I was a friend of your son. In fact, your son was carrying me when he was killed. May I come in because I have something for you? He said, I'm somewhat of an artist, said the soldier, and I want to give you this. 
I said, I'll let you man unwrap the package. There he found a portrait of his son. While it was no great piece of artwork, it did feature the young man's face in striking detail and seemed to capture his personality. But the following spring, the man became ill and he died. And the art world was in great anticipation. What's going to happen with this amazing collection? And according to the will of the old man, all the artwork was to be auctioned off. So the day arrived. And art collectors from all around the world came to try to buy some of these paintings, these world most spectacular paintings. But the auction began with a painting that was not on the museum's list. It was a painting of the man's son. The auctioneer asked for an opening bid in the room of seven. Who will give me a hundred dollars for this painting? Minutes passed without a sound. And then they started heckling. We didn't come to buy the son's painting. We came to buy the other paintings. Let's get on with the auction. And the other voices said the same. But the auctioneer said, no, we have to sell this one first. Now who will take the son? And finally, a friend of the old man spoke. I knew that boy. He was a good boy. And so I'd like to have that painting. I'll give you $100 for it. So the officer says, $100, he'll give me more. 100 100 5 110 Not a word was said. And finally, he goes to that man, sold for $100. And everybody started cheering. Now we can get on with the paintings. Now we can get on with the auction. And the auctioneer says, no, the auction is over. Stunned in disbelief, they said, "What do you mean? We came for the we didn't come for the picture of the old of the old man's son." And the auctioneers replied, "It's very simple. According to the will of the father, whoever takes the son gets it all." And that's how it is for all of us. The message is a summary of what Christmas is really about. But we cannot enjoy the joy of Christmas without the pain of the cross. All of the hope of the coming of the Messiah hinges on the true purpose for the coming of the Messiah. And that purpose is freedom from sin and freedom from death. So as we begin our journey to Bethlehem, let us remember this hope as ones who do not take the gift for granted. Let us remember what it was like before Jesus came when all were slaves to sin and death. And let's look to the baby born in the manger. Imagine looking into the eyes of the shepherds who gazed on the Lord for the first time, fully understanding what a huge fulfillment of hope the baby represented. Let's look toward the Christmas day with the same hope as our hearts, knowing the price that has been paid for our souls and knowing what a joyous and hope-filled thing it is to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Let us know the true meaning of the angel's words when she declared, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which comes to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. It is our Christ, our Savior, and our Lord who awaits us in Bethlehem. It is Him that we will journey these coming weeks, getting closer and closer to Bethlehem. And closer, the closer we get, may our hearts be filled with the great hope and expectation as we journey forward. The days are surely coming, says Jeremiah. And as we begin a new church here with the first week of Advent, we look forward to those coming days of watching and waiting and yearning and hoping. Hoping for our Messiah King, for a new life, for a new beginning. For justice and love and peace and joy among all people. Because hope is real, hope is restored. And it's perhaps most real in the midst of suffering and hopelessness. Whether it's the people of Jerusalem or Jerusalem under siege by the Babylonians, whether it's in the troubled spots of the world today, whether it's the poor, the homeless, the unemployed, or the underemployed here in our area, the days are surely coming when the Savior, the Messiah King, shall be born and shall grow up and live among us, shall teach and preach among us, to work miracles among us. And his name is Jesus. Jesus. And, his, and he shall face suffering. 
He will meet criminals' death at the hands of the corrupt and powerful. He shall be raised from death three days later, and he shall promise to live with us and through us until the end of time, and shall one day draw all people to himself to complete all of history and inaugurate new heaven and new earth and the new holy city, Jerusalem. Such is our hope tonight. But it's not just for tonight. It's there yesterday, today, and forever. Because the Lord is our righteousness. The branch from David's line. Jesus, whom we wait for, our side king. And for this is still God's work, message to the world, which God loves, and he's still in, the crow, in control. And this is our message of hope to all for a suffering, hopeless world. The world still needs a Savior. Maybe more than ever. And his name is Jesus. So they don't give up, for the days are surely coming. And so, this Advent, we live, we wait, and we hope for the days that are surely coming. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We stand and confess our faith tonight. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed, and we speak it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died, and was buried. He descended to God.
to lift thee up from my hands and lead me to sacrifice. Taught by our Lord, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And let us now pray the prayer, our Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, through your Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins, where I have done wrong. And grace to keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil fall may have no power over me. Amen. It is great to see you all here tonight, and we pray that you'll be back again next week as we look at the second candle, the candle of peace. Uh, I remind you that on Saturday at 1 p.m. in the afternoon, we will be celebrating the life of Dorothy Kruger. Uh, Mrs. Kruger who passed away in the October the 29th, but we do the celebration of life this Sunday, this Saturday at 1. And so if you'd be a part, we would welcome you to be a part of that celebration. And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. And we close with our last song, and Away in the Manger. Mm -hmm.